Um, thank you so much. I'm very honored to share the stage with uh, this group of people. Um, so I have uh, quite a mixed role at the Carnegie Observatory. So my main role is in part of our communications department. But I also have a PhD from Caltech in material science, and I worked in observational cosmology. So I'm kind of been all over the place. But currently, I am the, um, the chairman of our history committee, and that makes me the curator of plates at Carnegie. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our plate Carnegie and our plate collection. So astronomy is the science of looking into the cosmos and trying to unravel all the mysteries of the things that we see. The universe gives us light. So astronomers take this light and we try to pull it apart in as many ways as we can to learn everything we can about all these objects. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the deep field. Almost everything in this picture is a galaxy. It's about the size of a pinpoint on the sky. But not much has changed. That's a modern picture. This is a historical picture from our collection at the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. And I always like to include this to remind people that telescopes are the laboratories of astronomers. They're not pristine instruments. We're always working on them, upgrading them, fixing them. Um, and I think that shows well. Is there a laser pointer on this? Uh, yes. OK, great. Yes. So this is Edwin Hubble. And this is another astronomer, a very famous astronomer from England named James Jeans. And they would sit perched very precariously on, um, on a platform above the telescope and observe all night long. And imagine if this is winter, the dome would be wide open. It all needs to be the same temperature. You would wear layers of wool and fur and be sitting there all night long, probably with your eye through the eyepiece. So astronomy, we take light. So glass plates, as Leah introduced, it's an emulsion on glass. Imagine a light being admitted from a star in a faraway galaxy. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It travels for 23 million light years. That's a long way. That's a long way for it to come. And it happens to come our direction, hit our telescope, bounce <clears throat> off a mirror, get focused in, and then hit the emulsion and chemically interact with it. Like, I think that's really remarkable to think about that photon and how it traveled. So plates are negatives. This is how they normally look. The light turns the emulsion into a dark image. Of course, this is how we think about space, right? It's actually that it's dark with the light, so we have to flip that around. Um, and this is the one picture I have, and I'll be coming back to this, and this is what Leah was hinting at with a picture of me with Deva. This is the one picture I have where you can really see the physical plate. And I'm constantly fascinated by the idea of data as an object, because today we work with ones and zeros, and we don't have to think about this, of how you interact with an object and make science. So if you haven't heard of Carnegie, I don't blame you. We hide away, but we are the start of astronomy in Pasadena. We were here before Caltech became Caltech. Started in 1904, George Hillary Hale moved out here to build Mount Wilson. So Mount Wilson is our historical scientific home. We're down this uh, little side street. We're open once a year in October, so please come by next year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you just missed it. Um, we have this beautiful library, lots of wonderful spaces. This is the Hale Library. You probably don't realize if you haven't been there, you've seen it before. And you've probably seen a picture of this guy, and I don't think I have to introduce him. <laughs> came by in 1931, and actually these are all incredibly famous astronomers of their day. And the picture you've seen is one very similar to this, except he's looking right at you in the camera, right? The picture of Einstein writing at the chalkboard. But I wanted to show you this angle because, oops, because if you see here, this is the portrait of Hale. This was in our library, that very famous picture of Einstein. Um, so of course we're there because of Mount Wilson. Our offices are the historical offices of Mount Wilson Observatory. If you haven't been, please go. It's now run by an independent nonprofit. The, um, this is the famous 100-inch telescope. Uh, last year we celebrated 100 years of this telescope. First light is how you mark time with a telescope, which is when you first point it on the sky. First light on the 100-inch telescope was November 1st, 1917. It still works amazing. The glass is amazing. The seeing is amazing. So please go and try to look through it sometime. Um, you can rent the telescope for an evening. This is how it looks today. 
And it really looks like a battleship because it was made by a battleship company. So it's made with ribbons. <laughs> um, there's a, a daisy-shaped cover over the mirror that you can actually walk on um, if you know the right people. <laughs> it's, it's really a truly amazing instrument. So coming back to Pasadena, our offices um, on Santa Barbara Street, in the basement holds something really amazing. And that's this collection of astronomical glass plates. We have over 250,000 glass plates, and it's the second largest single institution collection in the United States. So Harvard's is bigger by about a factor of two, since I knew that question would be coming. So 250,000 plates sitting in an old bank vault in the basement of Pasadena, and almost nobody knows it's there. <laughs> so now you know, you are tied in. And it's really just this wonderful, amazing space. You open up the drawers, they're all organized by position on the sky or object type. Um, and it's really a record of the heavens. I don't know how else to describe it. There are three rooms. There's the solar room. We were founded as a solar observatory. There's a spectral room, which is taking light and breaking it out like a rainbow into its individual wavelengths. And then there's the direct image room, which is exactly what you'd imagine, pictures of planets and galaxies and globular clusters and nebulae and everything you can imagine in space. So why do we have so many plates here in Pasadena? Why in the world would we have that? Well, it's because the Carnegie Institution for Science has been a, a part of major, major telescopes around the world. So we'll start with Mount Wilson Observatory over here. So there's two great nighttime reflectors, which were the largest in the world each when they were built and held the record for several decades. And then there were three solar to permanently mounted telescopes and a whole slew of smaller telescopes. All of those were making plates every, every day it was clear and every night it was clear. This is a picture at Mount Wilson Observatory. Oh, sorry, at Palomar Observatory. This is the 200-inch Hale telescope there. Um, you can see Edwin Hubble sitting in the Newtonian cage up here. And so, yes, if you wanted to observe at this focal point, you have to sit in the cage all night long. Um, there are lots of telescopes there. We built Palomar jointly with Caltech. Um, in the 1940s. And then down here is our current observatory down in Chile, Las Campanas Observatory. Started in the late 1960s, so we made plates there for almost 20 years. Um, and we have a lot of really great telescopes and just looking to the future, we're building the giant Magellan Telescope, which will be an 80 foot uh, mirror telescope there. So discoveries, so this is now tying back into Leah's talk. Discoveries at Carnegie upended our understanding of the universe. If you took an Astronomy 101 course, you would be learning fundamental things that were originally discovered on Mount Wilson and in Pasadena at our offices. So I only have time to go through a few, so I hope that's okay. The first two will be galaxies, then the sun, and then the moon, coming back to our exhibit. So discovering our universe, 1923, Edwin Hubble. So Edwin Hubble uh, spent his entire scientific career at Carnegie. Uh, sorry, his professional career. He was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And when he arrived, he was not famous. And in fact, his first plates, if you look at them, are really terrible, <laughs> which is funny. He was not a very good observer. Uh, but he was pretty, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But he's pretty brilliant at putting all the pieces together. So in the early part of the 20th century, uh, astronomers understood that the universe, the entirety of the universe is our Milky Way, and that's it. But a few people in the 19-teens asked, is there possibly something outside of our Milky Way? Maybe a few things we're seeing are outside of it. There was a great debate in 1919. In fact, the Carnegie astronomer is part of it, Harlow Shapley, and he won the debate, but he was on the wrong side. <laughs> so he argued the Milky Way was the entirety of our universe. So Edwin Hubble was looking at the Andromeda Nebula, as it was called, and he was looking for a type of exploding star called a nova. And when he'd find them, he would mark them with an N, N up here. This is the plate that I was looking at with Deva. This is probably the most important plate in all of astronomy. So he noticed, so to find an exploding star, you need to find it over the course of several nights that it gets bright and then goes away. And what he noticed up in the corner was a star that would get bright and get dim, and then get bright and get dim over and over. And if you taste out its brightness, it would make a curve. So he crossed out his N and in bright red wrote VAR exclamation point. Now he could only do this because of the work of Henrietta Leavitt. What he had was a Cepheid variable star. When he found that, he knew he had a cosmic yardstick. So if he could measure how bright it got, how frequently it got bright, he could measure a distance. 
right? Which is amazing. <laughs> and, um, so to measure a distance, of course Andromeda is really far away compared to the size of the Milky Way. It's about 2.5 million light years away. Now if you talk to a modern astronomer, they say, yeah, yeah, Andromeda is super close. <laughs> We're actually, it's so close that our gravity is pulling us together. But back then that was a remarkable distance to measure. This was today, and I discovered something that totally changed our understanding of the universe. You better believe I'd write it up as fast as I possibly could. I'd work with our communications department, and we would do a huge press release and press conference, and I would tell everybody. But that's not what Edwin Hubble did. So he spent almost a year trying to find as many of these Cepheid variables as he could. So I actually consider all the plates from the discovery of VAR, which was 1923, the evening of October 5th, all the way through to the publication in January 1925, all those plates are part of the science that proves that our universe is much bigger than we are. And the Milky Way is not the only game in town. It's a Copernican revolution in our understanding of the universe. And these are really interesting objects because Edwin Hubble would write all over them. He would put question marks and exclamation points. He would put bright red arrows. And if you look close, there's a fingerprint in the corner. So when I work with these plates, I feel like I'm part of the process. All right, let's move on to another uh, discovery. Sorry, this got cut off a little bit. So again, it involves Edwin Hubble, but also this guy named Milton Humason, who's an amazing guy. He started as a mule driver at the observatories and ended up being on some of the most famous papers in all of astronomy. Hubble needed him because Humason was a really good observer and could observe really faint things. So what did they do? They took these spectra. So again, imagine taking light, um, sort of like the crystals, like in my grandma's house, you have these crystals that would turn things into rainbows. Uh, spectrographs do this. You can take light and spread it out into its component wavelengths. The stripe down the middle is the spectrum of a galaxy. The lines up and down are actually reference gases at your telescope. And you're looking for these weird little spots here and there and trying to figure out all these chemical components. But what were they doing? You can measure speed. So like the Doppler effect of an ambulance going past you, you can do the same with light. So you go, right? With light instead of uh, my weird sound, <laughs> is done with red and, red and blue. So if things are moving away from me, they, they are what we call red shifted. So Humason and Hubble measured a bunch of these and discovered, not only with their own data, by the way, I should also uh, mention Slifer from Lowell, they use some of their data, um, that galaxies, almost everything they're looking at is moving away from us. And this is a result that holds true today, that our whole universe is expanding, space itself is expanding, it's trippy. All right, let's move to the sun, because I think I only have a minute or so. So George Ellery Hale was a solar astronomer. This is a picture of the sun. Um, he did a lot of amazing things. Um, this is a picture next to Andrew Carnegie, who was our philanthropic founder of our institution. So one of the most amazing things he did, this probably doesn't look like a whole lot, but this is a sunspot. And he put one of these spectrographs, again, taking light and spreading it out, right onto the sunspot. Now, there had been rumors from telescopes, particularly in Germany, that they had seen this line splitting. So this is one of these spectral lines and you can see it kind of bows out a little bit. That happens because of a really strong magnetic field in the sunspot. It had only barely been seen, but George Hale had made some of the biggest solar telescopes ever on Mount Wilson. And when he did this, this is the first time ever they could take a photograph and measure the first extraterrestrial magnetic field. So this is the first time they found a magnetic field somewhere not on Earth, which I think is really remarkable and outstanding that you can do that at a distance. Finally, I wanted to end up with the moon, since that's why we're here. We have these gorgeous plates of the moon. The detail is stunning. I always pull them out to show people the quality of emulsions. Um, I wanted to show one as a negative, how the, how the plates really look. This one was taken in 1919 on the 100-inch telescope. Total overkill for looking at the moon, but that's OK. Um, so uh, a little science story. There was a, a group called the Moon Committee that was an interdisciplinary committee. Uh, they had almost no scientific output, but I'm going to tell you the one thing, one piece of science they actually did. And I found this picture today, and I was so delighted. Um, there were these two guys, Edison Pettit and Seth Nicholson, that they took a special kind of dete detector called a bolometer. And I'm particularly enamored with bolometers because my PhD thesis was on them. Um, <laughs> They are their temperature sensors. So they measure temperature all across the surface of the moon, both in sunlight and during a lunar eclipse. Now, why would you be measuring temperature across the surface of the moon? Well, they were trying to understand some fundamental nature of the moon. And the 
big result that they came out with, the temperature wasn't what you expect from a smooth rock in space. And in fact, based on the power that they were measuring, they realized that the moon had to be covered in an insulating layer of pumice. So they realized in the 1930 that the moon was covered in dust way before we went there. And I think that's really remarkable. The moon committee also did one other really cool thing. They made these moon globes. So this is a spherical glass plate. This is uh, glass was blown by Corning Glassworks. The emulsion was applied by Kodak. And they projected an image of the moon onto the globe with a parabolic mirror so that it didn't distort on the edges. Um, there's only four of these known in existence today, and we have one on display at Carnegie. Um, it was too big and heavy to be part of the show. So <laughs> I hope someday you can come by and see our moon globe because it's amazing. And lastly, at our headquarters in Washington, D.C., in the auditorium, I wanted to point out, because we have public lectures there, but the, um, the light fixture is a composite picture of the sun from Mount Wilson Observatory, and then phases of the moon all the way around. And I think that's really lovely. So the history of astronomy is a history of receiving horizons. Thanks.